Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Este, uh, eh, bienvenidos a una charla eh, más de que organizada por la Universidad de Chile, eh, la Escuela de Economía y Negocios eh, y por MIT. Eh, quiero darle la bienvenida a, a todos y recordarle algunas este, reglas de cómo vamos a manejar. Este, va a ser primero una presentación José Gregorio, eh, el dean de la escuela y... y y eh, después va a hablar a uh, Olivier Blanchard. Eh, toda la charla va a ser en, en inglés, o sea que de ahora en adelante voy a switcharme en inglés. Le quiero recordar a todos que hay uh, traducción simultánea en, en, en la web. So, uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome to another uh, chat uh, 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 organized by the MIT Latin American Office and uh, also by the uh, Universidad de Chile, uh, the FEN. Uh, um, Today we have an incredible pleasure to have Olivier Blanchard uh, with us to chat. Uh, Jose de Gregorio in a second will uh, do the in introductions. Uh, we are transmitting this uh, also in YouTube. Uh, if you go to the uh, FEN uh, YouTube uh, webpage, you will see that uh, there's a link there uh, for uh, directly transmitting this. I want to thank uh, first and foremost uh, Olivier for being here and his commitment. Uh, uh, to MIT and to the region for uh, for his uh, his incredibly uh, generous with his time uh, and thank you for that. Uh, please, all the questions uh, we will pay attention to the Q and A and the chat. Uh, this is going to be today uh, an active conversation with Olivier, so we will try to aggregate. If you ask questions in Spanish, we will translate, so no problem with that. Uh, just let us know and, 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 and we will just, uh, both Jose and I will be reading those and then uh, relaying those questions to Olivier. Uh, without further ado, let me just pass the baton to Jose uh, so he does an introduction to Olivier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto. And just I put on the chat of the, of, of the webinar the links to the translation in YouTube and the Facebook Live too. So let me just start saying that it's, it is an honor to have with us Olivier Blanchard. He's one of the most influential macroeconomists of the last decade. In our case with Robert, of course, there is a, a little bit of a bias because he had an even greater influence since he taught us when we were at MIT. Olivier is the Fred, is the Fred Bergsten Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Uh, although most of his academic life has been in Cambridge, after graduating from MIT, He went to Harvard and since 1982, he remained at MIT, even being chairman of the department. From 2008 to 2015, Olivier was the economic counselor and director of research department at the IMF. He made profound changes, for example, introducing the studies of inequality and macroeconomics at the fund, also a more modern, someone would say less orthodox view on fiscal policy and also on policies in emerging market economies. He remains the Robert Solo Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. Currently, he and Jean Tirol, a Nobel laureate, lead an expert committee set up by President Macron, which also includes Peter Diamond, Paul Krugman, Nick Stern, Laura Tyson, Jean Pissenifery, Philippe Ayon, Larry Summers, Larry Boone, and Daniel Cohen, to think about the post-pandemic world economy. We really think that this would be a great uh, 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 thinking that they would make and, and we are eager to know about that. He has worked on many issues, monetary policy, speculative bubbles, macroeconomics of labor markets, public debt, fiscal policy, and of course, I have, have written a lot on the recent crisis. So he has a massive amount of path-breaking research and also is author of two great textbooks, one for undergraduate, and another for graduates. So we're really glad to have uh, here Olivier and, and, and we'll, we'll have a conversation. Please Olivier, if you want to give some introductory remarks for us. Olivier. I'm here, and thanks for the kind words. Waiting for the first question. <laughs> I suspect that's what, what we're here for. Yes. So, uh, go, go ahead. I don't, I don't know who is going to ask questions. So you have uh, spoken many times about the three phases of the economic recovery that are waiting ahead for uh, development nations. Can you just uh, uh, give us a little summary of, uh, of the, how you see the recovery taking place? 
Sure. Um, you know, I found it uh, conceptually useful uh, to divide the time coming going forward in, in three phases. I, I think the first thing to say is that this is a recession or a depression like no other. Uh, the, the type of shock we've had is unprecedented, right? It's policy induced for good reasons, but it's policy induced. It's on the supply side with very strong constraints on the supply side. So it, when I hear people talking about the Great Depression and lessons from it, I'm a bit skeptical. I think it's really a different beast. The, the second thing to say is that I think in the range of opinions about the future, um, probably on the optimistic side, in the following sense, that I think that we fell into a very deep hole and the issue is how fast we climb back. But I have a sense that, that the worst is not, not surely, but almost surely behind us. And when I say this, I find that many people are actually surprised. So I think it's worth saying. I think most economists will agree with that. But uh, people in the street uh, are very confused about what's happening, what will happen. But again, I think that uh, going forward, uh, the slope is positive. Now, back to the, to the three phases. So the first phase, I think we're seeing the end of it. Uh, it's basically what happened when uh, we decided in various countries to reopen, to end the, the lockdown. And there, there was a mechanical effect, which is that firms which had closed reopened, typically not at full uh, speed, but they reopened. So much of the decline that we had seen when there was the lockdown just was undone. And the implication of this is that the numbers, which are roughly for the end of Q2, but the beginning of Q3, uh, are likely to be fairly good in general. Uh, I think there was a hope by, in particular in the US, that they would be great. And that would basically take the, uh, the good news all the way to the uh, election. Uh, that's not going to happen. It, but still, I think some growth numbers are going to be very good and you're going to see politicians use them to say this is a V-shaped recovery and it's great. Uh, we may see double digits growth rates for a while, but it's just a very mechanical effect. Uh, nothing very deep. But, so this is the first phase. I think we've seen in some countries the end of it, in some countries not quite. I mean, the numbers uh, for the US suggest that we may, have seen, we may have seen the end of it. Uh, the second phase, I think, is, is really the, the crucial one, which is between the end of lockdown and uh, the, uh, the coming of a vaccine, but the coming in the sense of you know, the availability of a vaccine. And we don't, we don't know. We really don't know how long it's going to be. I think that the assumption that it's going to be for roughly a year from now uh, maybe a bit more is probably the working assumption, but as we know, there's a, a fairly large standard deviation around that. Uh, and that's going to be a very tough period because uh, many firms are going to be confronted because of physical distancing, are going to be confronted to an increasing cost. I mean, restaurants cannot open at full capacity, but they can't have, they can't reduce the staff as much as, uh, as the number of customers. Uh, many of the examples here. Uh, that you can think of. Uh, and if nothing is done, then I think many firms uh, will, will go bankrupt and uh, many people will remain unemployed. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we'll talk more about it, I hope, but this is really where policy is crucial. In the absence of the right policies, then it could be catastrophic. With the right policies, it would lead to a slow improvement uh, that's going to depend both on the length of time and on the coming back of the virus. And again, here the US is maybe an outlier. Uh, and then there's the after vaccine part. By then, physical distancing should be a, a thing of the past. So restaurants should, should, should go back to, uh, to full, uh, full speed. Hotels should reopen. Tourism should come back. Uh, but still, we know that it's a fascinating uh, example of hysteresis. Uh, this type of event has changed the world permanently in, in various ways, right? So we know, you know, the most obvious example, I think, is for us, which is that we used to take the plane. I don't know about Roberto and Jose, but, you know, I used to take the plane a few times a month. That's a thing of the past. I'm now going to do much more of what we're now doing. 
And that's going to have an effect on business travel. It's going to have an effect. Telecommuting is going to be much more relevant. And this has implications for the size of cities, the organization of cities. That's going to be what we'll have to deal with when we get there. But the, the tough part is the second phase, right? It's uh, what we do with respect to the hopefully temporary shocks and how we protect firms, how we protect workers. That's a crucial part at this point. There's a question, Olivier, on, 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 on the chat and also something that you have studied for a long time and you just mentioned it, the hysteresis effect, which is uh, how transitory shocks may have permanent effects. Uh, how do you see the hysteresis effect that may happen after the pandemic, whether we may have for a long period of time, even after recovery, a, 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 a large rate of unemployment and, 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 and low growth? How do you see this? So on this, it's actually very interesting. So as you know, I, I pushed the hysteresis ideas in the 80s with uh, Larry Summers, and we thought of this as happening through skills, morale, people dropping out. And it looked relevant then. I, last year, uh, before COVID, I wrote a GEP paper on how I saw facts. And I must say that I was, I was a bit distressed in the sense that it was actually fairly difficult to see strong examples of hysteresis through the labor market. Uh, the example which was given for a while was the decrease in labor market participation after the financial crisis. And people said, see, much slower. That actually came back. And before COVID, we were back on trend. So I became a bit skeptical in the paper I wrote, uh, was a bit skeptical about the importance of hysteresis. Uh, too bad, because, uh, you know, once you have hysteresis, then you can tell uh, governments to be more activist uh, in a number of ways in order to avoid long, long run supply effects. I think what I see from this crisis is that maybe we were too narrow in thinking about hysteresis, which is hysteresis can basically change behavior. I had thought that hysteresis in the 80s had changed labor market institutions. And basically this is what led to employment protection and various other things. I think what we've learned this time is that it can change behavior. And once you have changed behavior, then you don't behave the same way. So I think this time, it may well be that hysteresis is, is, is relevant, that even when the shock is gone or mostly gone, we shall, we shall think differently about the world, we shall act differently. How important it is, I do not know, but I, I would say this is uh, the resurgence of the hysteresis uh, hypothesis. I believe this time it's different. <laughs> I, I, I have uh, two, two, two questions. One is uh, this, uh, uh, recovery that will happen in the short run, will you say that that will be about a third of the way, half of, a, of the way? So the, well, I used the, the, the to, I automatic used to, yeah. reactivation. So I, I, I made a, a gutsy call maybe a month ago. I said that we would go back about two thirds of the way. This was back, this was based on not science, but you know, some numbers. I'm looking at the disaggregated evidence and so on. I'm a bit less optimistic today. Uh, at least about the US and countries like the US, which is that this was on the assumption that the infection rate would be decreased substantially and countries could basically, you know, treat the health issue without major effects on, 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 on economic activity. And what's happening is, and it's also interesting, in the US, clearly this hasn't happened. And even if there is no formal lockdown, which I don't expect to happen for political reasons, what we see is something that we've seen throughout the crisis, which is people actually react at some point, they get scared. Mm -hmm. And so even if there's no de jure lockdown, there's a de facto uh, kind of lockdown, people stay home. So I would, I think I would decrease my number to one half at this point, uh, okay. which is still a big number because remember how, how big the fall was. And so again, when, you know, especially when you multiply the numbers by four, which is what is done with the statistics in the US, <laughs> yes. this gives you very impressive annual growth rates. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would say one half, if I had to take a guess. And it's, uh, so, but, so, but, uh, so the numbers that were released today, which had drop of the GDP of 30%, they did not surprise you, uh, or did they? Actually, it did not surprise me at all, uh, because 
I think it was in April, at the end of April, there was a real-time estimate, which I thought was very good in terms of quality by INSEE in France, which basically looked at you know, the decrease in activity sector by sector on the lockdown. And they got the numbers 30%, which is that when there was lockdown, activity was down by 30%. Yeah. And I've been carrying this number uh, since. Um, and I think that you know, these were real-time numbers with all the limits that, that such numbers have. But it looks like this was the right number. So the 32% number today strikes me as, as very much in this range. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to ask a little bit about hysteresis of labor markets, even though I think that you just said that yeah. you don't want to do that. Because uh, the way the U.S. is dealing uh, with the crisis is very different from the Europeans. So, right. so the U.S. The U.S. are using the unemployment insurance as the only welfare mechanism. If you think about it, they just fire people. And I think that in that world, uh, the longer and the more uncontrolled the virus is, the less likely the job will be available when the people should rejoin. Uh, so, and, so, and the more likely people will be divorced from the labor market. Yes, I think. Yeah. So, so can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the U.S. versus Europe? In, in these regards and how could we sure. have done it differently? Sure. Maybe, maybe we and can... I, I think there, there is really a number of really important lessons, which is that on the surface, you know, all the countries have done kind of the same thing. They basically decided to help workers who became unemployed or lost their job or lost their work. Uh, they decided to help firms through uh, loans partially guaranteed by the state. They advanced uh, central banks, advanced liquidity to uh, to firms, uh, most governments deferred taxes, uh, at least a number of taxes, and they, you know. So if you look at that level of generality, nearly all the countries look the same. Uh, also, strikingly, most of the countries forgot the very notion of fiscal austerity. You know, the month before COVID, there was no fiscal space, and the issue was how to dec how to decrease that because it was really urgent, right? That just went down the drain, uh, even, and especially maybe in Germany. <laughs> so that's very common. Now, I, then I think the differences are also striking. And they come from the implementation, from the details. Uh, so what Europe did uh, was basically to import the German way of doing things, which is Kurzarbeit, which is partial employment. So you stay with the firm. The firm pays the wages, but is reimbursed uh, by the state. It doesn't quite pay all the wages, it pays about 80% of the wages, but the firms are the channel. The people remain connected to the firm, so conceptually they are still employed, except they're not working. And uh, from a purely mechanical point of view, the firms know who they employ, right? And so they can send the checks, and they did. Now, the issue is, did the state kind of send the checks to the firms, which had advanced the money? But in general, it did. So this was very smooth. And in general, basically, workers who lost their work uh, were compensated very quickly in Europe. In the US, you know, the alternative approach was taken, which is the one you mentioned, which is, well, let's the firms lay off and just have the workers go to the unemployment offices. I mean, you didn't mention the checks of $600 yeah. you know, per person, but, but this was important and totally non-targeted and probably very expensive for what it did, but you know, it did the job. Uh, but the unemployment offices were utterly unable to process the multiplication by roughly 10 of the number of people who needed employment checks. So many people didn't get them. Uh, got them, you know, a month or two months late. And same thing with the partially guaranteed loans, in which there was an administration which was absolutely not ready to actually do the paperwork. So there were many problems, and I think that's one of the reasons why there was so much demand for the end of the lockdown, and people were desperate. I mean, you've seen the, you know, the pictures of food lines uh, in the US, people really not having the, the, the means to, to eat. Uh, and I think that that pressure is what led the U.S. to reopen too early. Uh, so it was really a mistake in the way it was implemented. But it's fascinating because at some level, you know, all the countries did the right thing. When you look at 
the granular stuff, you realize that implementation is absolutely of the essence and the US could up uh, in a big way. But also th this may be related to the, to the nature and the institutions of the labor market because it's much more flexible in the US. So they rely, they rely more on the, on the recovery that would be a, a much, much right. more hiding uh, and, and destruction is less costly for the firms. It would have been very expensive to take the US way. I mean, it would have been stupid, but it would have been very expensive because then you would have to have to pay severance and various other things. So this was basically telling firms, you know, you can keep the workers at home it's as if they were laid off, but you keep the, the contact and you don't have to pay salaries. Um, but yes, the two markets are very different. But, you know, in the end, and so, you, you know, the argument for flexibility here is not very strong. So, I mean, in the US, yes, people have strong incentives unless they receive a $600 check, which makes their income higher than before. Yeah. But otherwise, if you decrease unemployment benefits, which is what the Republicans want to do now, you're asking workers to basically look for jobs which are not there. And the vacancy to unemployment ratio is minuscule. So what's the point? You know, the usual more hazard argument, which is, well, you have to push people to take jobs. is true for some people, and there are some jobs which were created. But the notion that by decreasing unemployment benefits and in a flexible labor market, you're going to get people to get jobs. No, there are no jobs for the moment. And uh, therefore, I think that the more hazard argument was very weak, is very weak. So I'm not against flexibility, but in this particular case, I don't think it's doing anything useful. Yeah, no. I want to go back to your point about hysteresis. I realize I didn't answer that. I think when psychologically keeping the link with the firm makes all the difference. Yeah. I mean, I've talked to people who are, you know, on layoff, on partial employment, and they feel that they're still employed. They just go back. Now, maybe many of them will not go back and will have to look for other jobs when jobs come but psychologically i think it makes all the difference i mean you saw the increase in the out of the labor force numbers in the us yeah it's clear that some people said the hell with it whether these people come back or not is the discussion we had earlier yeah in fact in building on that it's a first first let me ask a question from a classmate rodrigo valdez uh, so that rodrigo is asking i, I, I know that guy you, yes. I know you know that guy. You <laughs> know him. <laughs> yeah, you slightly know him, yes. Uh, so uh, is, uh, is physical dis distancing a supply or a demand shock, uh, especially on phase two, the way you will see it? So when it's, while we it's are both. waiting... Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's clear that it's both. I mean, you know, people will be reluctant to go to restaurants. And so in that sense, it's a, not an aggregate demand shock, but it's a demand shock. Uh, but at the same time, Restaurants have to basically, you know, set up distance between tables. It's a supply shock. So, yes, I mean, if you remove the supply shock, there would still be a demand shock. I mean, if you remove the plexiglass in the restaurants, right, people would be even less likely to go. So, yeah, it's a combination of both. I mean, it starts with the supply shock, obviously, but people react to this and, and you know, they don't take planes and they don't, uh, uh, they don't do things that they could do, but they don't want to do. Yeah, so, so that leads go, going back to the firms and their recovery. So if, the, if there's a supply side component here, I mean, restaurants have less productivity. It's a, it's a solvency issue. So, so, so those jobs are not going to appear anytime soon. So it, it, it will well, be Well, anytime soon. Again, the issue is if, if you, uh, I think the expectation is that these jobs could come back you know, sometime between 2021 and doing 2021, right? I and mean, once we have a vaccine, maybe I'm dreaming, but, you know, I think many of these issues will go away. So these jobs, many of these jobs will come back. Now, whether all restaurants will come back, no, they don't, you know, they disappear even in normal times. But yeah, I think most of these jobs will come back. I see absolutely no reason why tourism yeah, should take a big hit. So... I think the issue is really how you, so that might be the next question, which is, you know, how do you make sure that it would be incredibly stupid to let the whole restaurant industry or the whole hospitality industry go bankrupt, right? Or the airline industry go bankrupt. If in a year, basically, you know, we have to recreate hotels, we have to recreate restaurants, we have to recreate airlines, right? So I think that the priority 
is we need to make sure that those which can survive once the vaccine is there have a good shot at it. We will not succeed doing it completely. And there'll be a lot of bankruptcies, but I think that should be the priority. Uh, there was an article by one of my ex-colleagues, Reza Mogadan, uh, yesterday in DFT, which argued that we should basically let these things go and we should concentrate on the sectors which can expand. I think that's completely wrong. I mean, for the moment, we have to concentrate on the sectors which will not die. Uh, I think that's a very important policy message. And for the moment, the priority of fiscal policy should not be aggregate demand. Right? It should be saving private riot. It should be avoiding catastrophes. Yeah. Right? In addition, there is an aggregate demand issue, and we can discuss it, but it is not the priority. The priority is to avoid millions of bankruptcies of small firms and so on. And, you know, the unemployed starving. So, yeah. Talking, talking about, about fiscal policy, so you, you just mentioned fiscal policy and, and you wrote a very important paper before the pandemic on, on the low interest rate and the welfare cost of public debt. And this was especially important in the US where the safe rate was below, the normal was below the growth rate. So paying debt was very easy. Now we will end with an, with an economy and with a global economy in which this can still hold, but with much higher level of debt. So the possibilities of increasing this premium or things like that uh, could be important. So how do you see the future and the state of public finance, especially in a world where, where monetary policy is at the zero lower bound, has less traction, so fiscal policy becomes more important, but also with this increasing public debt that in emerging market could be an increase in 50% of GDP and, and, and how, how do you see the, 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 the end of the, after the pandemic, the, the state of the public finance and the, and, the, and the ability of fiscal policy to do, to do macro policy? So I think it, it very much depends on the path of safe interest rates. And then, you know, we can talk about different, different spin advanced economies and emerging market economies where Clearly, one has to give a slightly different answer. But, you know, before the COVID, the yield curve for safe rates, you know, whether it's in Europe or elsewhere, in the US, uh, was incredibly low already. Um, and, uh, you know, to use my, uh, my uh, algebra, R minus G was negative by quite a bit. Uh, in that world, suppose that that world continues in the same way and interest rates remain very low, uh, uh, then I think that there is an enormous amount of fiscal space. I'll come back and I'll caveat, I'll, 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 I'll be more careful. But, you know, when you sit down with the algebra and when R minus G is negative, you can run very high levels of debt and still run primary deficits. You don't. And the reason why debt is dangerous is that at some point the primary surplus that you need to generate the interest payments, right? Because politically infeasible. And basically that's that's the story of that default, right? Uh, and this can happen because R increases, but if R if R minus G remains negative, then I think there's a whole lot of fiscal space. So I think the question is what can we say about future rates? And my sense is there, I think they are going to remain very low with very high probability. Uh, something that we should be honest about is that we don't have a full understanding of why they decreased so much from the mid 80s you know, to, uh, to now. Uh, we have a lot of potential culprits and it then seems relevant, right? So you have a uh, saving glut uh, either by countries or by people. You have the uh, investment uh, shortfall for various reasons because of the price of investment goes decreasing the, the value of investment and so on. Uh, and then you have a demand for safe assets, uh, which I mean, this is a good opportunity to actually mention uh, the work by Emmanuel Fari. And this is something on which you know, he and co-authors worked a lot on, uh, you know, where did it come from, what implications it had. So we, we don't know exactly what combination was responsible 
but it's clear that all these factors were potential culprits. Now, if I think about what's going to happen, it seems to me that each of these factors is likely to be even more relevant. On saving, I think it's very likely that there'll be for some time precautionary saving. It's not quite as obvious as people say, because you can be very worried about the COVID part, but still not save more. So it's not an income issue, it's a, it's a health issue. But my guess is, you know, we saw an enormous increase in saving during the lockdown. Uh, some of it will go away, most of it will go away. But I, I, don't, I don't see any reason to think that saving will decrease substantially. Uh, many countries are going to use some of their reserves to fight the outflows, which well, in the end seem to be limited. But if anything, I think these countries will want to rebuild reserves, which is an increase in, 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 in global saving. On the investment side, I think there's going to be a lot of uncertainty about what we talked about earlier, which is reallocation. And if you don't know exactly what's going to happen, you're very careful. The option value of waiting is big. So I don't see any reason to think that there's going to be an investment boom. Uh, you know, one of, these one of the characteristics of a COVID crisis as opposed to a war is that in a war you destroy a lot of stuff. So you get an investment boom. Well, we didn't destroy anything. Uh, so I, I would think investment will remain uh, very subdued. Uh, demand for safe assets, I see no reason to think that it's going to suddenly disappear. Uh, you know, it's there for regulation reasons, for uncertainty about the world and so on. And I think the world is more uncertain than it was. Uh, so it seems to me that when you think about this in a structural way, you conclude that interest rates are going to be running very, very low. Now, in addition, you can actually go to markets and look at option prices and get implied probabilities. And that's something that I did today for something else. So the probability, for example, that uh, investors put on the euro rate, I was looking at the euro rate, uh, being more than 2% in five years, short rate, is 3%. Namely, you know, the markets are going all out and are basically not having second thought. They just think it's going to be low. So, I think that the working hypothesis is interest rates will remain very low, in which case you have a lot of fiscal space. Uh, you can increase that a lot and you don't need to generate large primary surpluses. Now, I don't think we can ignore two things. So this was the positive message. Now I'm going to try to make Jose happier because with our discussions we've had often and he's much more of a hawk than I am. Uh, the first thing is if COVID comes back, and we need to kind of redo the same thing, then you know, we have another 10% of GDP, which has to be put there. Uh, that could lead to levels of debt that even I, I would worry about. I don't think it's very likely, but it could. And then you know, markets could be wrong, and my structural analysis could be wrong, and interest rates could shoot up, safe rates could shoot up. And well, in this case, you know, there's a risk. There's a risk that countries might be either tempted to default or use inflation as a way to, to get out of debt if they have, uh, if they have domestic currency debt. Uh, I think that risk is there. Uh, I've written something saying, you know, you can't completely exclude it. Interest rates go up, and our neutral rates go up a lot. There's fiscal dominance. The central bank obeys orders, keep rates low, inflation goes up, and then we have a mess. Uh, I don't think we can completely exclude it. Now, the, the Two more points. The, the first one is, okay, suppose that that's the case. Should we, should we be in fiscal austerity mode now? And I think the answer is not, because you know the alternative is to let catastrophes happen. So for the moment, I'll trade avoiding catastrophes now for a small risk of some point down the line. Could happen. And then the other is, you know, what I've said is very much about advanced economies. Uh, and it's clear that emerging markets may not have the same room, uh, even if investors don't worry about the risk, you're facing, you know, downward sloping demand curves. Uh, and uh, investors may decide that they have enough of, well, actually it seems to be, you know, not in trouble given your level of debt, but they may have enough of resilient debt, for example. In which case, it may well be that some countries should still spend, but they may have to go to, uh, you know, to the fund or someplace like this in the future. Uh, to basically be able to finance themselves. So it's possible. So, so, I mean, on that, bottom line, 
look, look at the numbers. There's really, you know, for advanced economies, there's still 50% or 100% room uh, for increases in debt. It shouldn't be used to do stupid things. It should be used to avoid uh, the worst. But yeah, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic it can be done. Yeah, but, but one thing that it, I, I like because you just mentioned something that I, I remember you are, you, are, you are writing some inflation outlook and whether inflation could go up, which I think I agree with you in the world economy, most likely inflation will remain very low. But when you make the case for high inflation, I was all the time uh, 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 coming to me emerging market economies. So very, you say, well, why inflation may go up? Because there is very high levels of debt. And high levels of debt in an emerging market is very different from an, from an advanced economy. The increase in the neutral rate yeah. and then fiscal dominance and, and yeah. the dependence of the of the, the central bank on financing the budget rather than doing a, 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 a inflation control. Right. So, so it's a, it's yeah. a kind of a, a there is, this is a risk. It's, this is particularly the story of Latin America fiscal dominance. So one thing that this, this may come back after a long period of low interest rate because of an excessive, I would say, levels of public debt. I fully agree with you that this is time for fiscal expansion big time and, and that's that's i think that's no doubt but but there is a risk so, of the yeah so I, it, there are many differences between advanced economies and emerging markets uh, but i think the crucial issue here is uh, salience so how do people think about inflation and in advanced economies basically at this age they just ignore that they basically think of a kind of phillips curve relation inflation is low and will remain if one day they woke up and they say, oh, no, no, there is high levels of debt, and we know that that historically leads to inflation, then I think expectations of inflation would change, and then we could have uh, an inflation spiral. Uh, again, I think that could happen. Uh, you know, mechanically, I think we can afford much higher levels of debt, but if people believe that that's an issue, then it could happen, and then the Phillips curve relation could be destabilized, and then we could see inflation. Uh, in advanced economies. I just, again, I've, I don't exclude that scenario. I've written about it, but it has very small probability, I think, uh, there. Uh, as you say, the history of emerging markets is different. And if people are still in the old mode that, you know, save debt levels are 40% or 60%, say, to be generous. And we're now at, you know, 80% or 90% in Brazil, say. And therefore, that's not sustainable. Then indeed, uh, inflation could come much faster. Now, what has to be done in this case, again, I think you should just proceed with spending what you need to do and then keep explaining what I do, what I've done for the last two years, that the old levels of debt, which were worrisome, are now very different in an environment in which the interest rate is low. Whether it works or not, that's the province of multiple equilibria, and we know that the risk is there. Um, but yeah, I that's one of the reasons why you, know, you clearly have much more careful um, than, than, than uh, the US or, or Europe. You, you have mentioned a couple of times uh, doing the right thing. So uh, can I uh, actually ask you two different questions? Uh, one would be about uh, the uh, inequality or income inequality or the social consequences of COVID. How do you see uh, governments uh, dealing with that. Uh, we had many countries that were on social unrest before COVID. Uh, many in Latin America uh, were on social unrest before this. Yeah. So th there will be consequences in the long run. And then the second one is one in particular. I know that you have written a paper about Toma about the particular things that the fiscal side can do that what you call the correct things. So I would like me first deal with the social unrest question and income inequality question, and then second, to deal with the uh, actual policies uh, uh, that, that we could do. And I think oh. that we in Latin America can learn a lot from that. I think they are the same questions, right? So well, <laughs> what, what should be done for people and what should be done for firms? And uh, so indeed, I, I wrote a paper with uh, Thomas and uh, Jean Pisani Ferry. Uh, so what we said, I think, is, is the obvious, which is, Unemployment is going to be high for some time, and there are not going to be enough jobs for people. Again, that's the vacancy unemployment ratio fact. So we should continue 
to provide unemployment benefits and be fairly generous. Not as generous as was done during lockdown. Uh, I think that in many countries we uh, overkilled. Uh, I, not the right word, but we we, we went too far. Uh, oh, sure. and, you know, there are plenty of anecdotal evidence that some people have higher income uh, than 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 in the absence of work. Uh, so this has to be corrected. Uh, but clearly, it's essential. You just cannot go back to the old unemployment benefit system uh, pre-COVID, at least for a while. So this can take various forms. Uh, what we've agreed, what we've argued in our paper is that we should keep the partial unemployment scheme, namely keep workers linked with firms, not prevent them from taking over jobs, but having, you know, as, a, as an option, the possibility that maybe they'll go back. Uh, we think it's important. On, on the firm side, so you should provide liquidity, but in fact, you should basically allow firms to, you know, especially small firms, uh, to borrow. And so we basically have argued for keeping the partially guaranteed uh, loans programs, which, which take various forms. Again, the US one is a mess. Uh, the European ones are typically better. Um, you need partial guarantees because given the degree of macro uncertainty and micro uncertainty, banks are extremely reluctant to make a loan to any restaurant at this point, you know, unless they basically know that they have very little skin in the game. They have to have skin in the game because otherwise anything goes. So you have to do that. Uh, you probably have to forgive some of the taxes which have been deferred. Uh, even if you do all these things, uh, you're going to have a very large number of bankruptcies. And that gets to your unrest part uh, because it's going to affect firms, it's going to affect workers. Because then conceptually, you have, you have firms which are unviable and will remain unviable, just cannot make profits in the new environment, this should go. But you're going to have many firms which are viable after the vaccine, uh, but have taken on debt. And of the small firms, you know, many of them were already at the limit of what they could take. And so they are insolvent, right? What you want is to save the uh, viable but insolvent firms. And for this, you need a bankruptcy process. Now, you know, in the US, there is this very nice uh, legislation with chapter seven where you close and chapter 11 where you restructure, but it's completely infeasible uh, when you're going to have literally, I think, hundreds of thousands of firms needing restructuring of that. And so what we've argued, and I'm not going to go into details unless you want to, is basically that it should be facilitated as much as possible. Now, the easiest way to facilitate is for the state, which this time is a fairly big creditor for small firms, uh, because of a partial guarantee on loans and because of the tax deferral, to basically just forget it, right? But that's very costly. And, you know, this would increase public debt. It's not the end of the world we've discussed, but it seems to me that the state should probably keep some claim. So there are other ways. Uh, one is for, for the state to take an equity position in small firms. Now, that seems like a, an oxymoron because they don't have shares. But in fact, it can be done by basically having a higher tax rate in the future on profits for firms which survive. Like so a profit sharing contract? Like, so it would be like a profit you, sharing contract. You tell, you tell, yeah, exactly. You tell the firm, look, if you don't make profits, no, sorry, you're gone. But if you make profits, you'll pay a higher tax, right? So this actually has, in effect, is equity finance. And that can be done uh, in some ways. Another way, which is uh, Thomas Philippon's uh, brainchild, is to basically tell the, the other creditors, the non-state creditors, go ahead, restructure. But if you basically accept a haircut of, say, 20%, then the state will automatically accept a larger haircut, say 50%, right? So this gives the incentive for the private creditors to actually come to some agreement about saving the firm, if it can be saved. Um, we've discussed it, I'm not sure it will happen, but it's, you know, it's in the range of a, of a conceivable in, in practical terms. That's not going to make things perfect. But the big issue in the, in the fall, will be that. 
And that's where, you know, what you were talking about before becomes essential. And France had the gilets jaunes and they're not gone. Yeah. And if you have bankruptcies on a large scale and you have layoffs in larger firms, which we've had with Airbus and, and Air France, uh, it could be an ugly fall. So again, I think they probably spend too much rather than too little. But I worry. Yeah, so there has been a, and there is a oh. question here in the chat and, 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 and there is a long discussion about the, 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 the need to have more revenue. So th there was some proposals and some part uh, to, 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 to having a wealth tax implemented now. So, so there is an issue about what the opportunity of increasing taxes and or even for the long term after the pandemic in order to, to, to increase revenues. Do you have some thoughts on yeah, I will not at this stage, I think, increase taxes um, because, again, partly for psychological reasons. Um, and, you know, there's the usual fiscal effect, which is overall what I've talked about is going to increase the income, is going to uh, allow some firms to function. It may not be enough if there's a lot of precautionary saving. We may need more than that in order to basically let, you know, let demand be big enough to to, meet, to match potential output. So I don't think that's the time for this austerity of any sort, uh, for mechanical reasons and for psychological reasons. Now, later on, it may well be that, and I think you want to give a signal that even if that is sustainable, uh, you're going to slowly decrease it. And it may well be that a wealth tax, which I think was in the work in many, in works in many countries before, is going to be even more on the agenda. Uh, so for the moment, no, I would not uh, increase that. I would not increase the income tax. I would not increase the wealth tax. But sometime at the end of 2021, I will have that discussion. Yes. Uh, you, uh, can we turn a little bit to the elections in the United States and how you think this uh, uh, moving forward? So, um, so do you think uh, you know? We all read newspapers. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah, no. I think that the one thing which may not be completely trivial, although I think most of us have thought about it, is I think that the Trump administration made the bet that they would basically open, and the growth numbers would be great, and yes, there would be deaths, but you know, they would basically focus on the growth numbers and they would basically win the election that way. And I think what we've learned is that the sign was wrong, which is basically when the infection rate is high, then you get behavior which doesn't lead to high growth. And so I think that bet has been lost. Uh, I don't see how it's going to be won again. And therefore, you know, I'm fairly optimistic that the result of the elections will be what I hope it is. And, and after the elections, how... Do you expect a very big change in the management of COVID? Uh, I guess the answer is yes. No? Yeah, I think we'll have, a, we'll have a, I hope. I mean, the big issue then, I think, will not be the current one. Hopefully not. Uh, hopefully the infection rate will be you know, under control or close to it. I think the big issue, which, was, which I discussed, um, I was not the speaker, but I listened to it in a Zoom yesterday, is vaccine distribution, production and distribution. Uh, you know, when a vaccine is available, who is going to get it? Yeah. And it would be very nice if we all kind of sang Kumbaya now and agreed to share it and, you know, countries which are poor get it and so on and so on. I suspect that we'll see a whole lot of selfishness We'll see both across countries and within countries fairly ugly behavior. And, you know, I don't know what the Biden administration will do, but at least they have thought about it. And uh, this, uh, this might well be one of the priorities uh, with respect to COVID, right? Yeah. In addition to undoing all the stupid things which have been done in the last four years. Why an, an international organization like the UN doesn't purchase the patent and then give it for free to the world? Wouldn't that be cheaper and better? I mean, like we all... We, yeah, but there is a production. We, anyway, there would be we, production. we don't know who is going to... We don't know where the vaccine is going to come from, so who do you give money to? Um, yes, I mean, there can be agreements, and there are agreements about, you know, being ready if you have a vaccine, 
the state will basically pay you X dollars per vaccine, right? That exists, but, but that doesn't solve the allocation problem across yeah, countries, no, no. which is when China finds, you know, suppose China is first and gets the vaccine and gets production going, right? Well, there are going to be two issues, which is, well, China want to share, you know, they have a few people, they have more than a billion people to, va to vaccinate. And will the U.S. be willing to actually accept the Chinese vaccine, right? Uh, it's a mess. And every day which passes without an agreement makes it more likely that it will be a mess. Uh, but yes, I mean, on paper, I can think of many solutions. Thinking, but politically, thinking, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Think, thinking about the long run, and we were talking yep. already about uh, employment, the, this pandemic, and, and, and you said at the beginning, there is, has been a lot of transformation. One of them is that uh, we will not travel as often as before, and there will be, we have learned it in university, doing online teaching. There has been a huge productivity change. Do you think that there is uh, something that uh, after the pandemic could be good for productivity in the world and for the, so, so looking at the positive side of the, I think we're too much influenced. I mean, the, you know, you, you read stories about humankind being different and we've all understood and so on and so on. I don't think any of that will happen. And I think we're too influenced by our own uh, changes, which is yes, you and I will take the plane less, but doesn't make for a very different world. Uh, you know, what are going to be the changes? Uh, so there are going to be some. Business class is going to be smaller. Uh, telecommuting is going to be bigger. Uh, that's going to change where people want to uh, live and therefore real estate prices, relative prices are going to change. Uh, I think universities is probably a place where there's going to be a lot of change. And the existing university mall was wrong before. I mean, it didn't make any sense for people to pay $50,000 in the US to go to a mediocre place when you can basically get you know, MOOCs and great Zooms from MIT, Harvard, whatever. Uh, so I suspect we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies of small colleges. We're going to see a reorganization of universities. We're going to see the tenure system being questioned. Um, so I think all these things are going to happen. Does this lead to a very different world? Uh, I've had this discussion with Steve Davis. I mean, there are people who think the world is going to be completely different. I'm more skeptical. I think there are big changes, but there are always changes. Um, and the changes may, you know, the larger changes may come from other slightly related sources, geopolitics, I think international trade, um, the changing global supply chains for security reasons rather than safety reasons. All this was, you know, was in the works before COVID. Uh, that may well dominate. Will there be more reallocation than the usual one? Um, I don't have a view. Um, agnostic. Wow. Uh, but the notion that the world is going to be dramatically different in two years, maybe, maybe a not. Follow, a follow-up question that, that is interesting and is everywhere, always the, the question to economic professors is, after the crisis, after the pandemia, there will be a change in the way as we approach analytically to economics. There is something that we need to learn much more to understand we have just to do the models with other questions or we really need to rethink many things? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I was, you know, in the first few months of the financial crisis, I was at least rather confused about, you know, the role of the financial system in macro. And I learned a lot. So I would say there, there was a, a major change. Uh, I think it made people more skeptical about the FDs and stationarity assumptions and so on. Uh, this time, no, I mean, the, I thought, I mean, I didn't know anything about epidemiology and I still don't, uh, but condition on what the biologist or the epidemiologists were telling me, I thought, you know, I, I had the tools very quickly. There were very good papers by, you know, Veronica Gregeri, Gregeri uh, Ivan Verning, uh, Guido Lorenzoni on demand and supply shocks. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that very quickly we, we had the tools. I mean, it was a completely new shock, which may never happen again, but I didn't feel I was, I was lost. Um, 
I still don't think I'm lost, but that just shows my ego probably. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I think the thing that has changed is the use of, you know, I think Roberto uh, gets the, uh, the, 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 the fatherhood for that, but the use of, uh, of, of much more data, uh, real time is aggregated granular. Uh, you know, this 30% decline in Q2, basically we knew it before yeah. before the number came out, right? And we knew it more or less in real time. And that has changed. I'm absolutely struck at how economists have been using granular data uh, to basically reach conclusions on this or that aspect of COVID. I feel, uh, I feel very old there. I've said it, I think, in a tweet. Uh, and econometrics is going to be different. Uh, the speed at which we learn what's happening is going to be different. That's going to stay. Uh, I think I had a tweet also about a presentation by Raj Chetty, uh, maybe a month ago, six weeks ago. I was flabbergasted by what he had put together, both in terms of big data, uh, but in terms of using it to answer questions, which are the questions that I wanted the answers to. You know what type of decrease in consumption had happened, who was consuming less, why. And that's a change. That's, it was happening, but I think COVID has made it happen much faster. Yeah, they need that, No, I, I, I don't feel guilty to that one. I, I, I think that economists haven't done badly. What, what are they, Twain, what are the three things that, uh, that worry you in the next, uh three, four years on, on this, in this path? What are the things that you think that we should pay specific attention? That... Again, I, I feel that at this stage, what I worry most about is the next 12, 18 months. And my attitude is, well, we'll see what happens after that. And we'll think about it. We can think about it now, but you know, there's a time for everything. And at this stage, we really have to avoid uh, something very bad. Now, that links to the, the remark that Jose made at the beginning, which is that I've been asked to actually uh, head a commission with uh, Jean Tirole on the post-COVID. So, you know, this is the answer to your question, right? What are the issues that we've decided to tackle? Well, not very surprisingly, three of them. So it answers your question. Uh, the first one is global warming. Is going to come back, and uh, you know, I think people now are convinced that if you wait too long and you don't, you're not prepared, you're in trouble. But that's going to come back uh, in an environment in which there is less money to finance it. Um, inequalities is something that you mentioned as well, and there again, we have to do much more because otherwise, populism will not go away. Um, and the third one, which is not for all countries. Um, is the aging, is population aging and the distribution effects that this has. So these are the three themes that we started working on um, and we'll give complete and conclusive and definitive answers <laughs> at, the end, at the end of the year. Uh, no, we will not, but at least that, that, that are the issues. But none of them scares me as much as, uh, you know, as the between now and then. I see. Good, very good. Uh, it's uh, one or two, so I want to be mindful of your generosity of being spending this hour with us, uh, Olivier, and uh, from all the participants. Uh, you, uh, I, I could not even read all the questions that we got both in the yeah, chat. Yeah, I, I can see today. that there are 29 questions waiting to be answered, but. <laughs> yeah, no, and in the chat, you have another 29. People can send me emails. <laughs> yeah, so, so Jacqueline, Jacqueline uh, actually puts uh, all of those uh, uh, for and you. you them. Yeah. Okay, that, that's very useful. Yes. So, so th thank you so much for, for joining us and thank you so much uh, for everyone that participated today in this uh, conversation. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Universidad de Chile and Jose uh, for all the support that we have been receiving uh, throughout all the this pandemic and in this chat and uh, and thank you Olivier for for uh, sharing your wisdom with all of us. Well, thank you very fun. much Olivier. Great thank seeing you. Talk to you soon. Yeah, talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.